Okay, hello and welcome back to another lecture. Today, we're gonna to just jump right in by talking about signal energy and power. Before we start, some quick announcements. The syllabus link is available at uh, the same URL, tiny URL, UCLA 102. If you're still having trouble with CCLE, please email the help desk. Uh, new to this announcement, I will be sending out the meeting minutes every week get my pen working here. Okay. Great. All right, so the pen works. Okay, so every week I'm going to send my office hour minutes out. And remember that your first homework is due on Friday, April 10th. Okay, jumping right in, let's talk about signal energy and power. Now in signal processing, one of the things that we look at is uh, as an EE field, we're inspired a lot by how we model circuits. So we'll often talk about a term called the power of a signal. And so before we talk about the power of a signal, let me start by just reviewing uh, how electrical engineers think about power. So for example, we might have here a ground, right? And we might have the ground connected to some sort of voltage source, like a battery, okay? That battery could be a voltage as a function of time. Now, we may have a simple circuit here where we have you know, a wire and then maybe this resistor, and then we're gonna ground that. Okay, so we have some resistor R, and then as the current flows around, we can model the current with a function I of T. Okay, so this is a basic circuit, and we know from Ohm's law that we can express this circuit as V of T equals I of T times R. Now, let us suppose for the moment, suppose that the resistance R is one ohm. So if the resistance is one ohm, then you will have a symbol like this. So if R equals one ohm, then the V of T is gonna simply equal I of T, okay? Now, that's, you know, something that we know from Ohm's law, and we also can express power in terms of Ohm's law as the following. Power, which might be a variable P of T, is going to equal V of T times I of T. And so this expression, we also know that this simplifies to V squared over R, which equals I squared. Now, recall, once again, if R equals one ohm, then the P of T is gonna equal V squared of T equals I squared of T. Okay? So the gist here that we're trying to communicate is that the power that we're gonna talk about in a signals and systems class is effectively the square of a signal. So the gist, Right, this is just a gist, is that squaring a signal is a measure of its power. I'll just put a disclaimer here, but it is not exact power. This is because we might not have that the resistance equals one ohm, right? So in this case, for example, uh, we would have still V squared over R or I squared times R, okay? However, that just still holds. If we square a signal, we're somehow coming up with a proxy of the power. Okay, so now let's say that we have this, this power. Um, the question then is if we have power over time, we may want to come up with a metric called average power. Okay, and average power 
is nothing but, let's call that p sub x. This is nothing but the limit as t goes to infinity of one over two t multiplied by the integral from minus t to t x of t squared dt. Okay, so this is a pretty simple expression, right? It's just an integral average that we're taking over the power of a signal. So here, the signal is x of t, right? And that's comes from the gist, right? The gist is that we're going to square the signal, and then we're going to take the average of that whole signal. Now, uh, if we look at this, you'll notice that, notice that our expression use this instead of something like this. Okay. And the reason that we use these magnitude brackets is in case the signal x of t is complex. If x of t is real, we don't need those vertical lines because the square of the signal doesn't require a magnitude. Okay, so this is average power. And remember that if we have power, power could be something like, um, you know, uh, uh, joules per second, right? That's often what you might have as units of power. So the total energy that we may want to look at as well of a signal is nothing but, you know, this relation. Energy is equal to power multiplied by time. And so in this particular example, once again, we're going to have a limit, limit as t approaches infinity. So this is the gist of how we measure a power of the signal and also what we consider the energy of the signal. Right now, this is fairly abstract, but when we talk about a quantity called Parseval's theorem, much later on, we will bring this elementary relation back. Okay, so let's move on. Now, if we have, uh, just a quick recap here, the power is gonna be joules per unit time. So for example, joules per second, that's gonna give you units of watts. Uh, in general, you may want to get the total energy of a signal across all the time x of t that the signal exists, in which case you integrate the signal. Okay. Notice that uh, the magnitude brackets here, uh, as explained on the slide, we incorporate the absolute value in case x of t is a complex signal. In addition, we can calculate the average power of a signal by simply taking the integral and this time dividing by the uh, integrand limits, right? Remember that the average uh, in integral form is the uh, is essentially this uh, division right here, which is the limits of the integral. Okay, so now let us look at some concrete examples of how we can simplify this expression to obtain the power of a periodic signal. Okay, and this brings us to the notion of something called finite power and finite energy, okay? Finite energy and finite power signals. This is also known as an energy signal or power signal. So sometimes people omit the finite from this. And the idea is as follows. If zero is less than the energy of the signal x, which is less than infinity, then that tells us something about the signal x. It tells us that x of t is a energy signal. In contrast, if Okay. then 
we would have that x of t is a power signal. Now, if we look at this, if the energy signal is bounded to some sort of constant, right? E of x equals some constant, then what can we say about P of x? So this is a check your understanding question. Before you pause the video, let me restate it. If E of x equals C, that means that the signal is an energy signal. That's equivalent to saying that's an energy signal for some C that is not equal to zero. Then the question is, what can we say about P of x? Okay, so you can pause the video and then rejoin us when you have the answer. Okay, welcome back. So those of you who would have gotten it, the power signal, if E of x equals C, then we know that P of x has to also equal zero. Okay. And the answer for this follows from the definition of what energy and power are related. Remember that energy, I'll just draw it to the left of the um, header. Energy, oops. Wow, okay. Energy equals the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral of minus t to t x of t squared dt. In contrast, power equals the limit as t approaches infinity of 1 over 2t times the integral from minus t to t of x of t squared dt. Okay. So you can see from the header that energy and power are very closely related. And so in fact, the power integral, the integral part of the power expression actually contains the energy. So in this case, if the energy is bounded, then we know that, uh, let's say this expression comes out to around C, right? Then we know that we're looking at the limit of C over 2T uh, as T goes to infinity, which is zero. So that is what this expression is telling us. Okay, very good. So let's look at an example by picture of some uh, power, uh, power and energy signals. Let me start off with the check your understanding. Let's have another one here. Check your understanding. And we will abbreviate this as CYU uh, very commonly in the class. So for example, if I have my axes here, here I have signal amplitude. And of course, here I have my friendly time axis. So let us draw a signal. I'm going to draw a signal, for example, in uh, what color should I choose? Let me use green. So I'm going to draw a green signal here. So the question here is, is the green signal an energy signal or power signal? Uh, why don't you pause the video and then you can rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So oh, the signal in green is actually, indeed, it's an, ener uh, it's an energy signal. This is, the signal is an energy signal 
because the area under the curve is bounded. You can actually calculate the integral of that, and you will end up with some sort of value from that ranges between zero and infinity, not including the limits. Now, this is an energy signal, and you can also uh, show this by seeing that the power signal, to just verify this, is also p of x equals zero. So we know from the signal that the average value of the signal is zero. We can just see that by picture. Why is the average value of the signal zero? Because right around here, asymptotically, it reaches zero. So that means that after this point, as we head towards the right of the graph, we have an infinite number of zeros all the way over here. So although you have some signal in, the, in this curve, it averages out to zero because you have an infinite number of zeros. So one way to do a quick shorthand to see if my p of x is zero is just to say that does my signal approach zero uh, for an infinite number of time, infinite amount of time? If it does, it doesn't matter what happened before, right? We could have had like the tallest signal here. This could have been, you know, 10 billion in terms of height, you know, 10 billion, but it wouldn't have mattered uh, because the signal decays to zero and it does that for an infinite amount of time. Okay, so uh, as another check your understanding, CYU, on the same graph, please draw a power signal on the graph above. Okay, so feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us. All right, welcome back. So an example of a power signal, we might have some signal that just looks like this. I could just have a sinusoid right here. And this signal is going to be a power signal, okay? In this particular case, the energy of the signal, right, uh, is going to be what? So if I have a power signal, what is, the, um, what is E of X? So if I have a power signal, it should be clear, hopefully, that E of X should be infinity. Okay. So if I have a power signal, then E of X equals infinity. So remember, we can sandy check that this squiggly purple curve is indeed a um, power signal because we can clearly see that E of X equals infinity, right? Because this signal, this uh, squiggly line, extends to all the way to infinity. So as I go to infinity, I'm just gonna keep adding squares of numbers over and over and over again uh, for an infinite amount of time. Therefore, this sum is not gonna be bounded. So E of X would be infinity. By contrast, the signal has an average value, right? The average value might be somewhere around here, whatever this number is. And therefore, the power of the signal is bounded. So this is an example of an energy signal and a power signal, which I also like to call finite energy signal and finite power signal, okay, just to be more explicit. Okay, excellent. So let us move on to the next example. Oops. Okay, how do I, next slide. Okay. So now let us continue our discussion of finite energy and finite power signals with an analytical example. So here, I'm going to have a check your understanding. We'll do it in red. So CYU. So X of T equals AE to the minus AT for all time t greater than or equal to zero. And I'm also gonna just say, just to make it simple, that a is greater than zero. Otherwise, the signal is zero. This is an example of exponential decay in a piecewise function. Okay, so here's how the graph of the signal might look like. You might have, for example, here's your time axis. And here we have our amplitude. So we have zero, 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 and then we have a decay. 
this is how my signal might look. So now the question to check your understanding is please prove analytically whether this is a power signal or an energy signal. Okay, so uh, the first thing you should do if you're asked this question is I would look at the graph and say, all right, what do I think the answer is? Um, so, you know, the first step I would do is, you know, proof by picture. If sometimes you can do it this way. And then the second step is proof by analysis. Okay. Since this is a check your understanding question, please pause the video and give it a try. Okay, welcome back. So let's look at the signal for a moment. What's happening is that the signal is zero. Uh, then we have the exponential decay. But as we can see, the exponential decay is going to approach zero um, for uh, a lot of time. So immediately we know that this is not a power signal, right? Because uh, p of x has to equal zero. Because I have an infinite number of, of zeros, asymptotically I'm approaching zero. So I can, in this particular mathematical framework of the class, we can assume that there is an infinite number of zeros uh, that arise at this tail. And of course, I have an infinite number of zeros that go all the way here to negative infinity. Therefore, I have an infinite number of zeros in my signal, and the average of an, any signal with an infinite number of zeros is going to be zero. Okay. So we know right away from the picture that p of x equals zero, and e of x is bounded. Okay. Therefore, the answer to this check understanding question is that this is an energy signal. However, you may want to prove this analytically, right? We may not know, uh, we know what a decaying exponential does, but we may not know in the real world that this really does decay to zero. Okay? We may not be given such a simple example. So it is worth being able to calculate this analytically. So let's take a look at how this would work. So let us erase this and write it in a different color. Proof by analysis. So in this case, how would we do this? Well, the first thing is let us write out our expression to show that the energy is bounded, right? So the proof by picture has told us that e of x is going to equal some constant c. So as a first step, what we can try to attempt is let's figure out what that constant c should be. So now let us write e of x equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of t squared dt. Okay, So this is my integral expression for the energy. Now, we know that this, for this particular function, is going to equal the integral from 0 to infinity of a squared e to the minus 2 at dt. OK, and what we have done to get from here to here is simply that we have realized that we only need to integrate the right-hand side of the curve. right? We don't need to integrate what is before 0, because uh, this signal was 0 before, uh, uh, before uh, the axis of t equals 0. All right, so that allows us to simplify the integral limits, and then we simply apply the squaring of the signal. OK, excellent. So now we have this. We can actually compute the integral. And if we compute the integral, we get something like the following. We get a squared over minus 2a e to the minus 2 at. And we're going to evaluate this integral from 0 to infinity. And so this is then going to be 0 minus a squared over minus 2a, which is going to equal a squared over 2a. Therefore, this is a constant. And we know now that e of x is indeed an energy signal if we needed further proof. Now, because e of x is a constant, 
it is easy to show either through integral or just you can automatically take this for granted that correspondingly p of x equals zero. Okay, so if you want to check your understanding again, you can attempt another question. So another CYU at home. And this example is you might be given a signal like x of t equals a sine omega naught t. All right, so uh, check that u of x equals infinity and p of x equals a squared over two. So if you want to pause the video and try to work, work your way to these derivations, that's fine. And of course, if these two things hold, then this would be also a power signal. Okay, very good. Now, if I look at this signal in red, this signal actually is a very special type of signal called a causal signal, right? If we start with this exponential example right here, this is actually known as a causal signal. Causality. Let us define what causality actually is. Causal signals are very useful because in, they, they give us some reference about the future, the present, and the past. And this is not, may not be, it may seem a little abstract today, but this will become more clear in the class when we discuss an operation called convolution and filtering. However, as I mentioned before, we want to just start with the basic tools and work our way up to more complex problems. Okay, so causality. Just by definition, definition, a signal is causal. A signal is causal if x of t is non-zero only for t greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so if I were to just express this colloquially, right? Colloquially, a signal only begins its life at t equals zero. The t equals zero time is very important. You know, you might think of that as like the big bang for signal processing, right? T equals zero is like some sort of, uh, uh, you know, your machine starts up or it's the beginning of time, essentially. So if a signal is a causal signal, it has some relation to this big bang. That's kind of what's, um, um, uh, what's going on here. So what that says is whatever has happened at T equals zero is causing whatever signal process this is, right? So in this particular example, uh, you know, we, a, a signal is causal if it has non-zeros non only at timestamps that are greater than or equal to zero. Now, we can also define something called an anti-causal signal. A signal, let me use a different color here. A signal is anti-causal if x of t is non-zero only for t less than or equal to zero. Okay. So some textbooks will write this as a strict less than, but most by convention write this as less than or equal. Finally, we have a third type of signal. And this third type of signal is the following. A signal is non-causal if the signal is non-zero for some t less than zero. Okay, so this is a strict equality. So colloquially, what this means is that the signal starts at 
prior to t equals zero. So let us analyze this with a picture. So let me draw our axes. And so here we have time. And in this particular case, we might want to start with a causal signal, right? That might be the easiest one to look at. So a causal signal would be something like the following. It's always zero, but then after a zero, at time t equals zero, suddenly things start to ramp up. So it might go like somewhere here. So this would be a causal signal. A non-causal signal, by contrast, you know, it may have a very similar curve here, right? It may even look nearly identical, but it also continues before time t equals zero. So clearly, whatever event happened at t equals zero may not have exactly caused this process. And that's kind of why this is a non-causal signal. An anti-causal signal has the following form. So think of it like just a signal that runs backwards in time. So what that might look like is you might have something that looks like this. And then at time t equals zero, it's zero, and then zero for all the rest. Okay? So whatever happened at t equals zero has stop that process, right? It's anti-causal. Okay, so this is a brief overview of causal signals. And once again, this will become more relevant. This is just a mathematical tool, but it's become more relevant. Let me just write this in black so it's not confused with one particular type of causality. But uh, in general, all these types of causality will become more relevant when we discuss convolution and filter. OK, excellent. Now we're going to switch to a different topic. And once again, I apologize for some of you that uh, we'll be jumping from mathematical topic to other topics. So we'll be jumping between different mathematical topics. But once again, this is all in the interest of building a foundation for the class. So now we're going to jump to complex numbers. Remember, all the signals that we've presented so far are real valued. But of course, we know that signals can also be, just like numbers, complex. So a complex signal would be a signal that takes the form z of t equals x of t plus j times y of t. So this is the typical uh, notation that you'll often see for writing uh, complex signals. You'll use z of t to represent the complex signal, and x of t and y of t to represent the components of the complex signal. In this particular case, j equals the square root of negative 1, right? So, so I'll just emphasize here that j is the imaginary number i. So um, those of you uh, who have seen i in your classes, maybe high school math classes, it's true that other fields like uh, um, uh, mathematicians and physicists often use i equals the square root of negative 1. So just as a you know, brief check your understanding, you can think, why do EE students use j equals the square root of negative 1 instead of i? And um, it's kind of fascinating, actually, because uh, EEs, like, the number of students that we have in EE is very, very large. It's like probably one of the largest in all of engineering. And so by pure numbers, the number of EEs is often at par with the number of mathematicians or physicists uh, working in, in the field. And so what that means is like, uh, it's not just about uh, what we use here in university today, but if you go out into workforce, there have been like fights about using I versus J in technical documentation at companies. All right, so once again, we have a complex number z equals x plus jy, okay? We're going to use j in this particular class because we're teaching it in doubly. E. In this case, you'll notice that the signal has two components. One component is this component x. The other component is this component y. In this particular case, x you can think of as being the real part of the signal, right? X is not being multiplied by anything that is uh, an imaginary number. So therefore, X equals, and we have a mathematical operation known as RE. So some people write this with a bracket, RE of Z, all right? 
which some people also write using script, like this real of Z. Okay. In this particular class, we're going to write this actually without the brackets, just because they're harder to draw, and without this uh, like script kind of font for R. So we're going to write this as real of Z, which is also very common and also easier to write without a uh, computer typesetter. Okay. Uh, likewise, uh, the expression for Y here would be the imaginary part of the complex number Z, right? I am of Z. And of course, people also write this as a script, for example, script I of bracket Z, okay? All right, so now you can think of this as being, this is the imaginary part, the part of Z, and this is the real part of Z. So the crux of the matter is a complex number Z, right? A complex number is really a set of two other numbers. This means number, right? Is a set or collection of two other numbers. One of which is real and the other representing the imaginary. Okay. So complex numbers will play a large role in this class. So we'll just review them to get everybody up to speed. Uh, feel free to skip this if it's too basic. Remember that a complex number, z equals x plus jy, which j equals the square root of negative one. Therefore, the complex number is simply an ordered pair of real numbers, x comma y. Uh, we have this operation, script r, that's called the real part. And in this class, we'll typically write re of z. By contrast, uh, we have the mastery part, script i, uh, operating on z, which we're going to use with this notation, i am of z. Uh, as an aside, we asked a question about why EEs use j as the imaginary number, while mathematicians and scientists commonly use i. Well, of course, in double E, i stands for current, and so we pick the next number down, which was j. Okay. Very good. Now, what makes complex numbers very interesting is that we can represent them as what are called phasors. So we might have a phasor as being a kind of polar coordinate representation of a complex number. So let me give you an example. So let us say that we have our axes here. So here's your axis. So this axis here is called the real part of Z, okay? And this part axis, the Y axis, is going to be called the imaginary part of Z. Okay. Now, if I have a complex number, some complex number Z, it lives somewhere on this graph. So here is Z. So in this particular case, Z might be something like this. Remember that Z equals x plus jy, okay? So uh, as a concrete example, we might choose some z where z equals one plus two j. This is indeed a valid complex number. So this is a perfectly reasonable complex number to choose. So now we've chosen a complex number, we can actually plot this on the graph. So for example, let me draw a little bit more to scale. Instead of z living somewhere, we can actually say that z lives uh, right here, right? So remember that y equals two from this particular example. So this equals two, this is your y. And x in this particular example equals one. So x might be somewhere here. So here's x. So in this case, x lives at one, y lives at two. And our complex number z would be located at that coordinate. Now, when we look at this complex number, we can actually draw this phasor representation here as being a vector that's coming out of the origin. This vector has some sort of length, r, and it also has some sort of angle, phi. Okay. 
So in this particular case, we can ask ourselves a few questions. This is a phase representation that's shown over here. We can ask ourselves, see why you, what is R? So R in this particular case is nothing but through Pythagoras theorem, R squared equals X squared plus Y squared. Okay, so therefore R is gonna equal the square root of X squared plus Y squared. We can also solve for phi. Right? Remember that phi uh, is going to, let's write tan phi, for example. So remember uh, this Sokotoa rule for uh, tangent, right? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So therefore, uh, the tangent of phi is going to equal y over x. And we can simplify this to say that phi is going to equal the arctangent of y over x. OK. So this is a phasor representation. A phasor is defined purely in terms of just r and phi. So once again, let me write down phasor here. Let me use a different color. So if I have a phasor, so I start first with a complex number, z equals x plus jy. Then I write that same complex number, z, as being equal to some r e to the j phi here. And we know that in this particular case, this is equal to r cosine phi plus j sine phi, which is going to be equal to r times x over r plus j times y over r, which is nothing but x plus jy. Okay. So to get from here to here, we just applied the phasor relationship. So we applied the phasor relationship. To get from here to here, we actually applied a special formula called Euler's equation. Okay. And to get from here to here, we just looked at that graph here. Remember cosine phi? right here. So I'm looking at this graph over here, right? So cosine phi is going to equal, uh, remember that cosine, uh, so katoa, right? Cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. So that equals x over r, right? And you can do the corresponding for to, for sine theta or sine phi. Okay, so this is just applying triangle properties. Okay. And that shows that you can take a, you know, equivalent representation like a phasor and get back to exactly x plus jy. Now, uh, we're going to go and go into Euler's number in just a little bit more detail later, but I'm just going to write it out so the seed is planted. Euler is nothing but e to j phi as being represented as cosine phi plus j sine phi. OK, very good. Let's move on. So once again, I said we would talk a little bit more about Euler's. And so Euler's is simply this idea that we have e to the j phi equals cosine phi plus j sine phi. Uh, you should definitely memorize this identity, not just for the exams, but in general, as a double E, this will come up in all your classes. 
Now, as a side note, Euler's actually leads, is considered one of the most elegant equations in all of math, right? e to the i pi plus one equals zero. If you plug in pi for phi, you should see that uh, you actually end up with, um, uh, with the simplification. Okay. Now, if you look at the five terms here, it incorporates five very special numbers in math. It incorporates e, Euler's constant, pi, the imaginary number, the multiplicative you know, identity, which is one, and the additive identity, which is zero, right? So we have one, zero, pi, e, and the imaginary number all in one simple equation with nothing else involved. So that's why it's considered one of the most elegant equations in mathematics. Okay, so just to recap, uh, with another picture here, just in case it wasn't clear with the handwriting, we also, uh, you know, when we wrote this uh, complex number in polar or phasor form, we took a complex number x plus jy and reduced it to r e to the j phi. Okay, r is the magnitude of the complex number z, phi is the angle of the complex number, and of course we have Euler's, which is always through and helping us. Okay, Euler's is the link between uh, the phasor representation and the Cartesian representation of a complex number. Now, it's also possible to go back to a Cartesian from a phasor. So we spoke about how using triangles, you would go from x plus jy to this. So we did that with the triangles, right, example. But you can also convert from re to j phi back into Cartesian coordinates. And so here's your handy cheat sheet of how you would do that. So these are the ways that you can convert seamlessly between Cartesian and polar coordinates to make phasors. Okay, now let's apply these ideas to a problem. So let us say that we want to add two complex numbers. So this is a CYU question. So let us say that we have two complex numbers that we want to add together. Let's say that we have x1 as being equal to, oops, minus one plus j. And you also have some other x2, let's write that in green, as being equal to the square root of eight times e to the j seven pi over four, okay? So to check your understanding, the question is, what is two x one plus x two? Okay. So take some time, uh, take a moment, and try to write this out on your own. Okay. Welcome back to the video. So in this particular example. Uh, let's see how we might approach this problem. So whenever we look at these numbers, uh, we should analyze whether it makes more sense to consider representations in Cartesian or polar form. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to actually start by converting things into polar form. Okay. So to convert things into polar form, remember that we have x1. We know that it has some, some representation, r e to the j phi. In this particular case, we can apply the identities in the previous slide to actually get back to square root of two times e to the j three pi over four. And of course, we don't need to convert x2 into this form because it's already there. So now, if we wanna look at x1 and x2, let's plot them on a graph, okay? And then essentially do a vector addition to come up with the resulting. So uh, in this particular case, uh, let us start by writing out in this lighter blue, 2x1 is going to equal essentially uh, square root of 2 times 2 is also gonna, is actually going to be the square root of 8, right? Square root of 8 times e to the j 3 pi over 4. Okay. So we've just multiplied x1 by 2, and that's as easy as multiplying the length of that vector by two, right? The, the, the r term, square root of two, we're multiplying it by two, right? Two square root of two 
is equal to the square root of eight. So now we've got the square root of eight times e to the j to the power over four. So what does that look like? Well, that looks something like this. You have uh, your blue signal here, and it's going to be over here. This is about 135 degrees, or equivalently, 3 pi over 4 radians. Okay. The length of this, the distance from the origin, is going to be the square root of 8. Okay. Now, if I were to look at the other signal, uh, the signal in green, then the signal in green is going to take the form of, well, we're going to be going at essentially uh, 7 pi over 4. Okay, So 7 pi over 4 would actually effectively take us over here. And so if we look here, the length of this signal is also square root of 8. Now, uh, if we want to analyze some other aspects of these signals, remember that we can always look at the real and imaginary parts. We can also calculate and add up the real and the imaginary together. So for example, this is going to be the real part of 2x1, right, which actually equals minus 2. And over here, we are going to have this being the real part of x2. Now, if I add these signals together, what do I get? Well, I can just see by my understanding of vector addition that the resultant for this check your understanding question, this answer is going to equal 0. And this representation was really easy when I converted to phasers and just treated them as vectors. OK, very good. The next thing we'll talk about is the complex conjugate. Remember that we had uh, some complex number z. Well, that complex number z has uh, a complex conjugate z star. right? That z star is the same thing, except there's this very, very critical minus sign over here. So that minus sign is very important because it gives us these really interesting properties of complex conjugates. The minus sign that we have here in the first equation uh, for the complex conjugate z star, we can also write complex conjugate pairs not just in terms of z z star and Cartesian, but also z z star also in terms of phasors. So for example, uh, we can have z equals we know that z equals r e to the j phi. That clearly holds. But what may not be as clear is we can also say that z star equals r e to the minus j phi. So this is the relationship between complex conjugates in the phasor domain. And we also know, of course, from Euler's that this is nothing but r cosine phi plus j r sine phi. And this is going to equal r cosine minus phi plus jr times the sine of minus phi. And so if I want to simplify this even further, I can write this as being r cosine phi minus jr Side fee. So hopefully you can see that now adding up z and z star, what's going to happen is that the imaginary part is going to go away, whether we look at this in the phasor domain or the Cartesian domain. OK, uh, where this becomes really interesting is in calculating the squared magnitude of a complex signal. right? So if I have some signal z uh, and I want to calculate the square of its magnitude, then I can simply just take z star times z, or equivalently because um, multiplication, uh, whether it's a times b or b times a, it's equivalent, I can also look at z times z star. If you want to go one layer deeper, you can see that this holds, because we have, uh, essentially, if you want to write this as a complex 
in, in Cartesian, you can use Cartesian analysis to show that ZZ star equals R squared. Now, as a quick check your understanding question, what would be the inverse of J? So uh, if I have a signal, uh, like let's say I have some number one, one over J, what is this equal to? It turns out that one over J is equal to minus J. And one way to see this is since J squared equals minus one, then clearly it must hold that minus J equals one over J. Okay. Now let's go through one more analysis using Euler's formula. Let's say that uh, you know uh, another relation that would be helpful to have on your cheat sheet or an exam would be the following. Cosine of theta is gonna equal one half e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta, okay? And likewise, a similar relation that we have for sine is we have sine of theta is gonna equal one over two j e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta. And if you want to sort of uh, use these identities in meaningful ways, you could actually, um, you know, when we actually solve signal processing problems, we're, we run into these all the time, especially with Fourier analysis. So we're going to actually apply this in one particular example. So right now, just assume that you have memorized these equations or written them on your cheat sheet. You have had some, like, you know, teacher tell you that uh, these two equations in purple are, are trigonometric identities you should memorize. So uh, let's now look at using these uh, in some sort of context. Let's say as a check your understanding question, show that cosine A plus B indeed is equal to cosine A, cosine B minus sine A, Find well, one way we can do this is we can start by essentially using these uh, Euler's formula expressions for cosine and sine. So one way to approach this is to say that, okay, cosine A plus B is going to equal one half multiplied by E to the J times A plus B plus E to the minus J of A plus B. Bracket. Okay. So all we have done here is we have simply used the identity for cosine replacing theta with a plus b. Now if we do this, then we can simply write this as one half multiplied by e to the j a, e to the j b, plus e to the minus j a, e to the minus j b. Let us use uh, blue to denote this portion, and we'll use red to denote this portion. We can now go and expand this as follows. This is going to equal one half multiplied by cosine of a plus j sine of a. cosine of b, sine of b, cosine of a minus j sine of a times the cosine of b minus j sine of b. And so we can, eventually we can just simply expand this out. So if we just expand this out with algebra, so just elementary algebra, 
we will see that a lot of things cancel and we will end up with this being equal to cosine A cosine B minus sine A sine B. Okay, so the point here of this slide, take home message, right, the sort of point of this slide is that the Euler's expansion for cosine and sine is very helpful when you're trying to get better analytical tools for proving things about cosines or uh, checking formulas and so on. Okay. TLDR is that uh, you know Euler's formula helps us analytically manipulate sinusoidal expressions. Okay. Speaking of sinusoids, sinusoids are, remember, our elementary signal that we work in in this class. And so previously in the course, we have discussed this quantity of a real sinusoid. A real sinusoid is nothing but x of t equals a cosine omega t minus b, right, or minus theta. In this particular example, remember that omega also equals 2 pi f. So in this case, you can get to the next line as saying a cosine 2 pi f t minus theta. Remember that a was the amplitude, omega was the frequency, the angular frequency of the signal, or the natural frequency of the signal. And then finally, the, uh, the ordinary frequency, when we don't use an adjective, just a regular frequency of the signal, is simply in hertz, and that equals omega equals 2 pi f. The frequency f, ordinary frequency, is the inverse of the period, given by this equation. Finally, theta is the phase of the signal in terms of radiance, which shifts the sinusoid. So here's a simple plot of a sinusoidal signal. So here we have uh, x of t equals a cosine omega t minus b. Okay. Good. Now, where this becomes interesting is in the context of complex sinusoids. So we discussed real sinusoids before, but you also have this complex sinusoid. So in signal processing, particularly in this class, when we think about Fourier transforms, when we're breaking a signal into sines, uh, sinusoids, like when we talked about those orchestra examples, we're not really doing that uh, for real sinusoids. We're doing that for complex sinusoids, typically. And so it becomes handy to actually, you know, even though it sounds difficult, it's actually easier to work with complex sinusoids. For example, in this particular case, you know, just uh, the complex sinusoid is entirely given by a e to the j omega t plus phi. And so you can see if you use Euler's that you can decompose it into a real part, which is the cosine, the standard cosine wave, plus this imaginary part, which is a sine wave. Now, if we wanted to draw a signal that is complex, um, you know, we can't really draw uh, complex signals, but the way we use, uh, shorthand it is we use dotted lines. So in this particular case, the sinusoid is drawn with a dotted line here. And then you have your corresponding real and imaginary parts. So here we have the, uh, this would be the cosine. And use a different color so it doesn't overlap. Real part. This is the cosine. And then finally, we have the imaginary part, and this is the sign. So, uh, you know, if we wanted to write a cosine wave, we could write a cosine wave as simple as just saying, you know, e to j omega t would give me a nice uh, cosine of omega t. And so this, these are very compact representations of uh, sinusoids. Okay. Notice we don't need to explicitly write down sine and cosine. I could just write the exponential uh, j omega t. Okay, so we're going to stop the lecture here and uh, you know continue next week talking about elementary signal models, which will include exponentials, damping, and then show that a lot of these will just fall under this complex sinusoid as well. Thanks for your attention and see you next time.